good afternoon. Welcome back here in Boston in the afternoon to our last session of our sixth annual symposium on patient-driven precision medicine. Um, we have a real treat because as was foreshadowed in several ways throughout the day, there's a lot that we can learn from what's been happening in both our assessment of and in the treatment of COVID to hyper uh, individualized therapy. And the principal deputy commissioner of the FDA uh, made that very, very clear that she really uh, sees a lot of lessons there and the significant overlap. So we're fortunate in having a star team uh, giving us the, uh, th their view of this and I'll, they'll be introduced shortly. And I just wanna say in terms of uh, a plea, if you can spare two minutes at the very end uh, when we're done, I'm gonna give uh, just a two minute synthesis of what I thought were the imp important messages of the entire day. But let's now proceed with the show. This uh, panel is being uh, moderated and led by uh, Professor Galit Alter, who's a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and a group leader at the Reagan Institute of MIT, MGH, and Harvard. She works on system biology tools, to advanced therapeutics, and she received a uh, bachelor's and a PhD at McGill and completed her postdoctoral training at uh, the Partners AIDS Center at MGH. And clearly, uh, has been a leader now in our uh, Boston-based uh, and international efforts in developing therapeutics. So Galit, over to you. Thanks so much. This is um, going to be an exciting session. I think we're going to have fun, interactive, uh, moderated session um, after the talks. But just to begin, I'm going to start off with uh, introducing our first speaker. So Dr. Paul Farmer holds an MD and PhD from Harvard University, where he is the chair of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. He is also the chief of the Division of Global Health Equity at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Additionally, Dr. Farmer serves as the United Nations Special Advisor to the Secretary General on Community-Based Medicine and Lessons from Haiti. We are very fortunate to have Paul as our first speaker to kickstart this controversial session. Welcome, Paul. Thanking you, Galit and Zach, and all of you who organized this for including me. I'm going to add, uh, by way of explanation uh, to those participating, that uh, um, I'm an infectious disease doctor, uh, but my PhD is in anthropology. And one of the one of the you know things that I learned as a medical student uh, uh, when I was puzzled uh, about the recommendations made by specialists, which came to resemble very highly patterned uh, kind of, for example, you consult a neurologist about a patient, uh, she might say, do an LP, or uh, you consult a gastroenterologist about a patient and she might recommend uh, endoscopy. Um, and with a patient that had asked not to have an endoscopy, a patient who was more of an, this is, I was still a med student, uh, I asked the resident, um, well, why did this patient uh, have an endoscopy? The patient died a few hours later. And uh, the resident said to me, uh, will you call the GI consult, a gastroenterology consult? And uh, I said, yeah. He said, ask a pizza man what's for dinner. He'll tell you pizza. So anthropologists, medical anthropologists, are going to talk about social, um, the social aspects of precision medicine. And, you know, going back to the definition, one of the definitions that appears in the, in, in the materials for today, which I'm sure was already discussed at, at the earlier this morning um, from the National Academy of Med Sciences Committee, uh, it meant taking an explicit multi-dimensional view of patients, not just one data modality, uh, such as genomics or environmental exposure. So subjecting the current um, crisis, the COVID crisis, because there are several going on at once, you know, what are the multidimensional views that we're often missing? And, and I, I'll say this uh, as someone who's been involved clinically and also in uh, evaluating the contacts of people in Massachusetts uh, who have um, been diagnosed with COVID. And what, what we see is that the multidimensional view um, that 
many adopt in medicine and public health erases or elides the social conditions that determine surely risk of infection or determine much of risk of infection and also determine the course to a lesser sometimes but invariably to the course of the illness. And let me give some examples. And I would argue that as much as uh, I'm down with the term precision medicine, um, social medicine, which is a, a, a the much older construct, a couple hundred years older probably, also calls for multi-dimensional views of patients um, and, uh, and uh, many in social medicine are very interested in epigenetics and, in, and, and are obliged to be interested in environmental risk. So my argument here, just to launch the controversy, if that's what Galit wants, is uh, to argue that without a broader view, which precision medicine can offer, and social medicine reliably does, without a broader view, we run the risk of impoverishing our analysis of what's happening with COVID in individual patients, in communities, and in countries as, uh, with as histories as varied, not only of ta uh, Taiwan and the United States, but Italy and Germany. So how do we explain such massive variation in spread and in case fatality and uh, and it, and a truly comprehensive view of precision medicine would uh, would answer uh, that challenge um you will remember probably in january when we first started reading some people maybe earlier first started reading about a new uh pathogen that caused a, a viral pneumonia there were comments about well this this could be the big one which it would seems to be be becoming, uh, but also uh, erroneously claims that this was respiratory pathogen. It was going to spread everywhere. No one had immunity to this pathogen, it was alleged. Therefore, it would become a great leveler. That is that we shared risk as a species because we did not have uh, an antibodies to, uh, to the novel coronavirus. One minute, now, Paul. Uh, oops. One minute. Well, all this to say that we now know that that was completely false, that the color of COVID is brown and black, that uh, the course of illness and the risk for infection both have been greater in communities of co color. In some cohorts, we saw uh, um, the majority of patients um, presenting with, in some cohorts, urban cohorts, majority of patients presenting uh, were people of color. And when they were not uh, the majority of of the city uh, of the city or polity in which they were found. Instead, we found prisons, packing plants, and of course, nursing uh, homes as as uh, the built environment. In other words, as uh, amplifiers of the epidemic. Now, in the 19th century, and I promise I'll close. Many of these variations in risk and outcome would have been attributed to genetic or hereditary, what were called hereditary uh, factors. Um, those usually have not panned out, and you know, certainly in the major discussions of, for example, why do so many people uh, of color, uh, that was not the term at the time, why do they die of tuberculosis at, at dis disproportionate rates? Those did not pan out much. Um, and epigenetics uh, are, are, are being studied now. But in closing, what I would uh, offer as my challenge, and, and I'm gonna learn a lot here, is that to have truly precision medicine we are not going to be able to look uh, at the pathogen uh, to describe its radically varied course in different populations. As um, this conference calls for, these are patient-driven and, and or host factors very reliably, and they're socially constructed. And, and I, will, um, I will ask, uh, leave it at that, and I will close in saying that we really do need to look at uh, conditions that are not readily, they're not often even studied in, in medicine. How do social inequalities arise? How do they become sustained? And what, how do they alter risk of infection and of the course of illness? So uh, thank you for allowing me to, uh, you know, to insert that view in, in this conference.
Thanks, Paul. That was wonderful. So I think we're going from population to social structure um, as a way to think about um, how we're going to deploy therapeutics and vaccines. So our next speaker is um, Albert Barambasi, um, who is the Robert Gray Dodge Professor of Network Science and a Distinguished University Professor at Northeastern University, where he directs the Center for Complex Network Research and holds appointments in the Departments of Physics and Computer Science, as well as in the Department of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. He is a member of the Center for Cancer Systems Biology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. He is Hungarian born, a native of Transylvania, Romania, and he, re he received his degrees um, from Budapest. Um, Dr. Barabasi, um, can you take control of the screen? Welcome, and we look forward to this very different perspective on precision medicine in the context of this discussion. Indeed, Galit, and thanks, Galit, and to Isaac uh, for having me. And uh, I, I define myself as a network scientist, and I spent the last 10 years really thinking about how we can actually use network-based tools to really predict the drugs and predict the impact of the drug and eventually to design new drugs. So, uh, and in that process, uh, uh, we ended up kind of developing a, a series of tools that I will share very briefly uh, to you with uh, you, effectively trying to, uh, trying to kind of uh, uh, detect potential drug targets in different complex systems, uh, uh, different complex cellular systems. And so the idea behind network medicine that we pursue in my lab, and I'm assuming that you see my slides now, is that nothing in the cell that happens, happens in isolation. It happens to interconnectedness. The molecules interact with each other, they bind to each other, they, uh, they engage in reactions with each other and so on. And you must account for that interconnectivity in order to really think about how a disease emerges and eventually how do we cure it and how do we intervene to cure it. And the tools of network medicine allow us actually to define the disease model, which is the network neighborhood where the disease resides. Think of the cell as being the map of Boston, and you would say a certain disease only resides in a certain network neighborhood. So the disease module is that neighborhood. But once we have that disease module, we can actually identify drugs that hit in that particular neighborhood and have the potential to perturb the disease as well as drug combinations. And eventually this will lead us, does lead us to uh, what we call personalized network medicine or what you would call uh, precision medicine where we use combinations of drugs to be really personalized to an individual. Now, when the COVID hit, we as many others were really motivated to do something about it. And we realized that we also had the moral uh, responsibility because these tools were really designed to rapidly identify drug repurposing uh, candidates. And we needed drugs and we need drugs. So we deployed these tools to really understand what drugs could be effective against COVID-19. And to understand how we approach that, first, we are starting from the picture of we have, we are curating all the physical interactions that are existing in the cell. And that's what I call the human interaction here on my slide. These are typically physical interactions between human proteins. But then of course, this human interaction is being now perturbed by the virus because the viral proteins enter and then bind to certain uh, uh, human proteins. And as soon as the data became available, how the, which, which human proteins the virus binds to, the viral proteins bind to, then we were able to define what we call the COVID-19 disease module, which is the network neighborhood within the human cell where that is being perturbed or hijacked by the virus. And the question we need to ask in the context of drug design or drug repurposing is that are there already drugs on the market that hit in the right neighborhood uh, so that they could actually perturb the, uh, the ability of the virus to bind? And so in order to execute this program, we start, of course, from the human interactive map, which is about 8,000 proteins and between them about 30, uh, 300,000 interactions. We start from the targets of the SARS-CoV virus, which is about 320 human proteins. And of course, we start with the, with the drug target list for about 7,500 approved drugs. 
And what we did is that we deployed three different methodologies that were independently de uh, developed by other groups and us to identify drug repurposing candidates. Some of them are based on what we call network proximity, simply who hits close to the COVID uh, uh, targets. Others, however, are based on AI methodologies that look at the world picture and predict who could be actually uh, the proper drug repurposing candidates. One minute, and last one. Sure. And the result of that was a very long list of drugs, a prioritized list of drugs from which our colleague Joel Oscalzo has selected 86 that are clinically potentially relevant. So what we did effectively is that we took all the 7,000 drugs that are out there and we ranked them for their potential ability to perturb the COVID disease, of which 86 now are sent to actually needle and they were tested experimentally both in monkey cells and in human cells. And just to give you a reference, when you actually test typically a recent test of about 12,000 drugs had a 0.25% hit list, uh, hit rate. However, the list that you see in front of us, 47%, according to the experimental data, had an effect on COVID. So now these are being transferred to human cells, being tested once again there, and hopefully in a week or so, we'll be, we'll be able to do clinical trials on them. Why am I showing you all of this? Not because to look at the particular drugs, but to say we have a very rapid methodology now to test any drug for its potential relevance for COVID. And once we have tested high, we can also tell you the disease mechanism, how is actually that particular drug is, uh, uh, is, is perturbing the COVID module. And I think this will be a model not only for COVID, but also future diseases for which we can very quickly screen the existing drugs for potential impact. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Right down to the atomic level of precision. Okay, so our next speaker is Dr. Russ Altman, who is the Kenneth Fong Professor of Bioengineering, Genetics, Medicine, Biomedical Data Science, and Computer Science, and past chairman of, Bioen of the Bioengineering Department at Stanford University. His primary research interests are in the application of computing or artificial intelligence to problems relevant to medicine. He's particularly interested in methods of understanding drug action at the molecular, cellular, organismal, and population level. So I think we're going to get the full picture here. So um, if you can grab control of the screen, Russ, welcome. And we look forward to your seven minutes of controversy. Thank you. Uh, and, and, and it's great. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me and best wishes to everybody. So um, I want to do a couple of disclosures. I am a general internist MD, uh, but I'm not currently treating COVID patients. So my, in, my instincts about uh, hyper individual, individualized therapy will not be coming from uh, being in the trenches. It will be come from thinking about the trenches from uh, basically this room for the last three months. Uh, secondly, uh, I am a biomedical informatician, data scientist and AI person. Uh, and that informs a lot of what I'm about to say um, and I'd like to say that initially when I was invited to a session on hyper-individualized treatments for COVID, I laughed because I would take a totally generic treatment for COVID-19 right now. And so the idea of hyper-individualizing, uh, but however, in the context, especially of Paul Farmer's comments, uh, when you think about the broader picture, there are actually v many things we can do in a hyper-individualized way at the social and cultural levels that I do recognize. The final disclosure is as a data person, I feel very lucky because we can hop around to different scales. And in fact, Galit anticipated that I would be a little bit like this. Uh, when you're a data person, you are not wed to any particular experimental scale. So whereas there's a real fundamental question about whether we are real scientists or not, because we don't go and do experiments in general, um, that aside, we have students and, and postdocs and staff shoulder to shoulder, some of whom are looking at the molecular level, some of, of whom are looking at claims data, some of whom are looking at global data, and you can do that when it's all just data. And I think that's the power of the field. Okay, so now I'm going to share slides. We, I think it's clear to say, the great variation in COVID-19 disease is not fully understood, but we have amazing leads. Um, but before we even look at data, we know some categories. We know that there may be variations in the virus that we need to pay attention to, 
attention to uh, that would um, lead to different outcomes. We, and again, uh, building on what Paul said, we know that there are environmental, uh, and this is environmental writ large, uh, cultural, social, behavioral, and exposures that could be altering the response to the viral exposure. There are many of our colleagues were looking at the genetic um, efforts. Uh, the UK Biobank released some of their genetic data for the patients who had been infected by COVID and I think some controls, and there are others as well. So before you even look at data, you know that there are these bins and they all require confirmation, ideally a mechanism, talk about that in a second, and intervention options. In general, data will give us correlations. Sometimes data gives us causation, but it is a much more complicated activity. Uh, but those correlations still set us on a path. And in general, I call it, when we're trying to understand mechanisms, I call that science. Uh, and so data is a hypothesis generator, at least. And, and then we do use data and other mechanisms to understand the mechanisms. Uh, so. The, the, the task is to look at correlations and mechanisms to try to understand what we might be able to focus on in an individual in order to give them the best chance at success in, in, in going through uh, with this disease. So my, this is my final slide. Uh, and I wanna tell you about three activities that we're doing uh, that really do go across a range of scales. We're doing collaboratively with United Health Group. Uh, they, um, cover something like 90 million lives, maybe more than that in the United States. And therefore a large fraction of patients who have had COVID have um, their records, both claims and lab records available to United. And to United's credit, they offered to work with us to look at the drugs that patients were on uh, and try to understand if there was any evidence in their data about drugs that might be risky or protective. Now, what do I mean by that? If we saw that patients with COVID uh, in the hospital compared to patients with COVID who are not in the hospital, were taking a drug more frequently as, a, as an association or a correlation, that would be interesting because that would tell us that either that drug is causing problems that leads to hospitalization or that that drug is correlated with something that might lead to, to hospitalization, one such minute. as the disease that it treats. Did I hear one minute? One minute. Yes. Um, and then also even more interesting, what happens if the people in the hospital are on average less likely to be taking a drug that the people who are out in the community with COVID but not hospitalized are taking? That might be a protective correlation or, or, or uh, hypothesis. So I can tell you that we have found both risky and protective drugs. We are not convinced yet that our controls and our statistics are right, but I hope to be helping United Health Group report that uh, in the future. Uh, and this would be a source potentially of a hyper-individualized therapy based on what the diseases are and what's being treated. I will skip the second one because it's very similar to what um, uh, Dr. Barabasi just said, and I'll go to the third one which is that in collaboration, uh, in an international collaboration with the University of Western Australia and folks there who have long relationships with Jakarta and Indonesia, we are looking at trials for early intervention. So as soon as you get po tested positive, can we put you on a cocktail of drugs to alter the course of the disease in a meaningful way? Can we monitor you, monitor you at home? And can we uh, generate using drugs such as uh, Dr. Barabasi just uh, disclosed and also some ones that we have some ideas about. Can we create drug cocktails that bend the curve, not for the population, but for the individual patient? If we can do that, that would be a big deal. And uh, there is a very good clinical trials infrastructure there. There are good relationships and it's still in the planning phases, but uh, it's an exciting thing to be part of because it might lead to some useful answers. All of this, I must say, while we await new treatments and new vaccines, which of course must be uh, the, the name of the game. Uh, but until then, I think that these kinds of efforts for repurposing and understanding what the data is telling us about drugs to which people have already been exposed is an, an important opportunity. So thanks very much. I look forward to the discussion. Thanks very much. Um, so our next speaker is going to be Dr. Mark Namchuk. So Dr. Mark Namchuk held a number of senior research positions over a 17 year career at Vertex Pharmaceuticals, including SVP of North American Research and Interim Global Head of Research. 
Mark started his drug discovery career at Cubist as the head of the enzymology group. Over the last 24 years, Mark has directed drug discovery efforts in numerous therapeutic areas, including infectious disease, oncology, neuro neurodegenerative disease, and psychiatric disorders. Mark recently joined Harvard Medical School in 2020 as the Executive Director of Therapeutics and Translation, just in time for the COVID epidemic. <laughs> we are now fortunate to have Mark close off this particular um, uh, session uh, or this part of the session so we can get into the fun discussion component. Mark, can you grab the screen and sure. uh, take into the debate? Great. Uh, first of all, thanks to the organizers, uh, Zach in particular, for the invitation to participate. I'm going to give you a slightly different view that I think in infectious disease, one of the unique challenges, particularly if it's an infectious disease that you want to be able to uh, treat on a worldwide scale, the precision can't be in understanding the patient response. The precision has to be in the molecule. And in fact, if one takes a step back and asks what's historically been the most successful way to treat a virus, it has been to design molecules specifically to go after viral targets that are expressed by that virus, and then uh, the, to be able to remove anything else that it would be hitting from a host or otherwise perspective. So I think that one of the challenges that's, uh, that has uh, come, come across in the recent crisis has been the entire world stepped away from infectious disease research for a period of time, and in particular, away from the research that would be aimed at developing medicines specifically to treat a virus. So I'm just gonna share my screen here. And this is a slide that we've been using for uh, uh, the therapeutics working group within uh, the Massachusetts Consortium for Pathogen Readiness. It's a group that both myself and uh, Galit belong to. And I think it, it's emblematic of the challenge that's in front of us. And I think uh, I'll, I'll seize on something that Dr. Altman said. I think you want to do something that you can do today, but I think we have to acknowledge our probability of success goes up as these efforts become more constrained and focused down on the actual virus that we want to treat. So without doubt, and a big part of what we've been doing in, in the Mass CPR Consortium is to look for the potential to repurpose drugs. I think if we look at our success to date in the COVID outbreak, it's worth noting that the only molecule that's shown credible clinical activity was actually technically not repurposed. It was an antiviral designed to be broadly acting on the RNA polymerase of an RNA drug. And that to date, other things that have been pulled in from other indications have shown modest success or in some cases, no data to support efficacy to date. Now, the methods are getting better. And I think the things that are going to be coming in the future are much more likely to work. But I think we also have to understand, as a, as a lifelong drug design guy who used to work on structure-based design and chemistry, the way I think about drug repur uh, building a drug is it's a little like tailoring a suit. You, and let's imagine that the person we're tailoring for is six foot four, broad shoulders, no waist, big guy, and you've worked on this jacket for five years. And then you're going to go ask whether that jacket fits someone else. It might, but the likelihood that that jacket's going to fit again is not nearly as good as going to tailor another jacket. So two of the other activities that we've invested pretty heavily within the consortium and which I think have to be pursued in parallel with drug repurposing efforts are things like therapeutic antibodies, where again, you're engineering something to have an exquisite amount of selectivity to just treat the virus. And then also to broaden out what we can think about from a repurposing perspective into molecules that don't have as much clinical experience yet, but as we gain better understanding of the replicative cycle for the virus, have a more likely mechanism to bump into what would actually drive replication. Uh, maybe my closing remark would be to say that as we think about not ending up in the situation we're in right now with a corona outbreak in the future, one of the things that um, we can borrow from flu preparedness is to begin to design drugs that are not only going to be useful for the current outbreak, but steal our understanding of zoonotic transmission, genetic drift, to try and design molecules that actually treat corona, but with a broader spectrum of action. So a beautiful amount of imprecision, if I will, to be the skunk at the picnic on precise medicine. And that, in fact, one of the issues that has really befallen us in the coronavirus outbreak, there is nothing from a therapeutic 
perspective that was ready and off the shelf could, could be the first line of defense as we begun to rally an extraordinary effort around either a new therapy from repurposing or a vaccine. And I think we're now living through the consequences, both social, economic, and medical, of not having made that sort of an investment. Uh, when I was still at Vertex, one of the programs that I ran was in pandemic flu. And in fact, the molecule that we developed is now in phase three testing for, for influenza. And I think at that time, most of the preparedness agents, agencies saw therapy, not just through the window of being able to interdict when someone was already ill, but really through that window of the first line of defense. So my advocacy as we think about precision would be to remember that uh, we have to do our chemistry very precisely to prepare for the next wave of corona outbreaks. We are now, unfortunately, potentially in a, an era where we may see a zoonotic transmission every six years with varying amounts of lethality and various varying amounts of contagiousness. And that while we should rally to what we can do immediately, that we should place efforts into using what we've learned over 30 years of doing design of antivirals to be more prepared for the next time. Thank you. That was great. That was great. Thank you, Mark. So now we're going to go into a bit of a discussion for a few minutes. And so I'm glad everyone's up. Um, so maybe I'll start off by asking the first question. So just as a counter argument to Mark's last point, um, the idea of going after the molecule, precision molecular design, as opposed to precision medical design, is there not a role for um, the way that um, Dr. Varabasi is thinking about the situation, as opposed to thinking only about the viral target, but thinking about all the other molecules in a given individual? that can shape how that one target molecule functions within a given individual, is that not pertinent? And thinking about all those genetic variants that could influence how that molecule is targeted, is that not where precision medicine at an individual level does play into efficacy of molecular design of drugs? Did Mark, you want, you want to start? start? Believe, or? Well, I'm, I'm <laughs> go for it. <laughs> then I'm happy. I'll go second. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. Well, I mean, it is, and I think, but I, I think we also have to look at uh, when we think about precision medicine at a time scale issue, right? I think if we have all the time available and we would have a fast way of approving drugs, then Mark's way would be the perfect way to way, go. And that's what we should be doing. The reason we actually kind of embarked on the uh, uh, pre-purposing is because it was pretty real that it's in, pretty clear it was impossible to get at the time scale we needed a new drug on the market, right? It's just not going to hit the market at that time scale. We, and so, so therefore, I totally agree with the analogy that we would, I would love to have a suit that is perfectly tailored to me. But if I would be in the <laughs> hospital, I, I'd be happy with anything that covers me and gets me out of the hospital alive, right? So, so I think of drug repurposing indeed as not getting the right suit but getting any cloth that would cover me and protect me for the time being. Uh, and, and that's what we can actually achieve through the drug repurposing uh, uh, process. And this can actually go further. So one of the things we're now starting to do in the lab is, uh, as Ross has mentioned, actually is it effectively to do now drug combinations. The same pipeline that can predict individual drugs can predict drug combinations as well. And, and also, as microarray data will start emerging about the individual patients, we may have the opportunity to tailor to individual uh, patients the drugs. But for that, we need a, an arsenal. We need something to throw at the patients. And I think we're still in the first phase of figuring out what are the keyboards that we can touch. And now, once we have the keyboards, then we can touch them together, and that's the next phase. Great, I like that, tailor-made drugs later. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just, I'll say that I actually completely agree with that point of view. I'll only add two points, Galit, maybe to the way you had phrased the question. I think that one of the challenges with an antiviral or an antibiotic that you wanna deploy worldwide is you actually hope to design something that does not depend on the genetic predeterminants. And in particular, if it's gonna be deployed in, in environments where you don't have access to that sort of Mm -hmm. uh, molecular precision, that's going to be a detriment to its broad utility. Mm -hmm. So I think that when you can do it, and I think particularly with SARS-CoV-2 in terms of the severe inflammatory syndrome, I think that is what we will have to do. 
We'll have to chop the disease up into pieces and understand why individual patients respond differently. But as a goal, yeah. But as a goal, I think to make something broadly deployable, you need to go to the highest common denominator of the biology, which my argument would be is the virus itself and what makes virology and bacteriology different from areas of other areas of medicine. For a second, I thought you sounded like an academic. Just wait, a wait, second. Yeah. Just a second. Okay, <laughs> let me go to Paul. I want to come back to Russ. So, Paul, I've got a question for you. I know you, you started talking about, you know, thinking about different populations, and you really, like, kind of struck a chord there. So have we not been doing precision medicine already tailored to different populations as we go into different socioeconomic categories and different ethnic groups. When we think about what is acceptable therapeutically in one group versus another or what might work, you know, from a perception perspective or from a genetic perspective, have we not been doing this already in some shape or form? And, you know, how can we start thinking about precision population level, you know, design? Because that's already going on. You're on mute. Okay, there you're not anymore. All right. Uh, first of all, I I, I think it, it it's clear. I hope it's clear rather that uh, you know, as a clinician, I'm banking on my colleagues here who are looking for precision uh, medicine in, at the molecular level, um, and looking back at some of the you know, if you take viral pathogens uh, that cause enormous mortality, HIV, HCV. Um, and that has clearly uh, been the recipe for a great deal of success, right? The, the, the strategies that, as Mark said, have been used over the last 30 years. And then once we have uh, an effective uh, deliverable, and, and by that I mean a vaccine for a preventive, a vaccine or other preventive, a diagnostic, and these are also going to be uh, molecular, and, and uh, as we know from our, our colleagues, uh, there's very powerful ways to understand uh, the, the nature of community transmission through uh, genetic sequences. So again, sorry, preventive, diagnostic, and of course, finally therapeutic. So I'm, I'm counting on you all to find the deliverables, um, which are gonna come out of labs and out of uh, the, the efforts that Dr. Barabasi has, has described of looking at already uh, available somewhere in the market. So the population-based, uh, just to you know, just to twist your question, Galid. Uh, yeah, we are delivering uh, precision-based medicine, but it's not pre precision-based medicine that is lessening the toll of COVID-19 among uh, communities marginalized by some of the forces that we have. So uh, as a team player who is counting on. Uh, you know, the trialists and the, the basic scientists to, to, to develop that molecular level precision and that systems level pre precision in an individual patient, there, there are clearly things we could do to render our social diagnosis and social support um, much more precise, if you will. And if you'll just give me one example. So if we're doing a Massachusetts-wide contact tracing initiative, uh, and just to give you some of the numbers as I understand them, of the hundred or so thousand cases in Massachusetts, the team that we're working with has already been in contact with 26,000 of them and with had made 300,000 calls to their contacts. Um, and that required uh, hiring 1,900 people. When the contact tracers talk on the phone to either those already diagnosed or those who uh, are contacts of the diagnosed, what we hear is often is a lot of talk about their social conditions, whether or not they're essential workers who are, you know, uh, obliged to take risks that people who have other more resources don't take, whether they have comorbid disease like diabetes or COPD, whatever it may be, whether they have alterations in renal or hepatic function. So uh, I do think that we're doing it, Galit, but I think we're doing it the wrong way. We're not tailoring our uh, multi-dimensional view of precision medicine to the whole individual and certainly not to entire communities yet. The well, good thing is that can be, done. Yeah. that can be done. 
Thank you. That's great, Paul. Well, hopefully we'll learn. Um, okay, so one last question I have for Russ. Um, so one question is about um, testing drugs. And so right now we've got all these drugs that are flooding the market, going into very rapid testing within hospitals and all the patients trying to get something, you know, out there as fast as possible. Should we have been binning already based on all of your categories that clearly are emerging? Are we doing this initial discovery piece properly as opposed to only thinking about what's happening between the mild and the severe disease individuals? And can we be using this type of AI information to do precision level clinical trial testing to get us that end goal more effectively? You're on mute. Great. So thank you very much for that question. And yes, there's, so there's so many uh, factors to, in your question. So let me just try to pick out a couple. So, so first of all, um, I think there are opportunities for stratifying patients in rational ways that will make the drug trials more effective and convincing because just giving everybody in the population a drug is going to be risky and risks no, 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 no result. So that was a great point. The second very important point is uh, we are looking at novel trial designs. Uh, you can almost imagine giving like almost like a binary search, like we give a uh, two medications to a bunch of arms. And then depending on how those arms do, we either merge the arms or separate out the arms. And so there are very talented clinical trial design people who can apply that. So you can use the AI on the front end to divide up the patients. You can also use the AI in the, in the trial design. Um, you, you also talked about uh, the, the, the monitoring. So, you know, just deciding what to follow in these patients and what, uh, what a measure of success is. One big argument we had is we had some people saying we have to follow the viral RNA. And there were other people saying, no, we, we have to follow clinical outcomes. And of course we care about clinical outcomes, but the viral RNA designs led to a much more efficient trial. But then you're asking uh, community health leaders to trust that as a marker for likely health outcomes, but not proof of a, of a health outcome. So I think the high level is, you're right, we, we can step back now and try to be very rational. Um, the population of patients for these trials is, in, at least in the Bay Area, around San Francisco and Stanford area, we are, have been pretty successful at lowering the curve. That's great for our patients and for our community, but it means that our trials have all come to a standstill. If you say, Russ, why are you talking about Jakarta and Indonesia? They're expecting a, a big pulse. Uh, Ramadan is over. There's a, a bunch of reasons why, unfortunately, we, we might see a spike. And so we're looking around for the right places to conduct these trials of course, with appropriate ethics and appropriate on the ground clinical care so that we can get these answers. And in, in the Bay Area, there are literally tens and tens of trials that have just stalled because of a recruitment. So it's a huge issue. Yeah, so, so hopefully we can add precision medicine to the front end of the drug development, not just to the back end. That's right. Okay, thank you very much. This has been a wonderful panel. Thank you all for your um, willingness to go rapid fire. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Zach. Me. Yes. All right. That, Galit, that was wonderful. Uh, you should have taken over the whole conference. It would have been certainly easier for me and more entertaining. Um, so this is the portion of the um, panel where we invite uh, audience questions that will be read out loud to us by uh, Dr. Ken Mandel. But um, as before, we have people um, learn how to use their Slido uh, interface by uh, entering, uh, by seeing a poll and uh, then uh, doing a quiz. As foreshadowed before, there will be uh, three very nice branded prizes uh, made to the three top winners of our, uh, of our quiz. And those will be posted later on our website. Uh, so congratulations in advance to whomever you are. And I actually sent the answer to this uh, question in a previous uh, panel. So you, you should know the answer to that. Man, apparently communication is not my forte, okay. And maybe remind folks that the Slido is right there on the same web page if you just scroll down below the live stream. That's right, that's right. All right. We'll just give this another 10 seconds or so before we move on to the quiz. Yep. Uh, 
Let's go. They listened. Well, all righty then. So, Dr. Mandel. I presume you're seeing a list of questions from the audience. Can you please pr proceed? Great. So um, let me start actually by asking a question to Paul. Um, and Paul, your pizza man anecdote at the beginning reminds me of the exact analogy I had on one of my first days on the wards as an intern, where the same thing, a GI consult, an obligatory endoscopy, but the comment back was, you go to Midas, you get a muffler. And uh, Zach, that was, as you will recall, from the great Esau Simmons, uh, once upon a time. So- uh, you conclude that GI is a fount of great- <laughs> It seems to be a theme. So, um, so Paul, let, let's, if we were to roll back the clock to, let's say, March, and you are now in charge prospectively of precision social medicine. Yeah. What's your prescription for preventing Chelsea, Massachusetts from happening? You know, I wish I, wish I, I, wish I had prepared for that question. It's such a perfect one and one that everybody who's a critic should, and, and, and involved in the response should be obliged to answer. But I mean, I can say some of the things that I did say, um, you know, some of us argued, uh, you know, especially when we heard this uh, specious talk about the great leveler, that we should really concentrate on um, getting ready to do contact tracing and to provide because testing, tracing, and then supportive isolation are the next part. What does supportive isolation mean? It means having a place to go uh, where you're being fed and cared for and sheltered and not in contact with anyone, which I'm able to do here, but most people who I see as patients are, are not able to do. That sounds very vague, but it's not because we've been doing it later. We've been renting hotels. We've been, you know, Harvard University is, is certainly going to have uh, the inn at Harvard as it, at its disposal and, and many other buildings. No doubt. So that's something that I wish we'd done early. We also recommended large scale amnesty for prisoners. And had we thought about meatpacking plants, we would have said, well, there's no possibility of having social distancing here. And again, all this while waiting for the uh, specific therapies that we're discussing today, whether they're or, or preventives. So I think there were a lot of things that could be done. Um, I, for the life of me, all of us in social medicine and infectious disease and epidemiology, et cetera, and precision medicine are struggling with the radically varied case fatality rates. I mean, you know, these are not, going to be described uh, you know, through genetic differences between Italians and Germans or between people in, in Taiwan or, or, or Wuhan. So I do think, I mean, that's kind of a lame list, but they're all actionable policy items. And in fact, they're being embraced now tardily uh, after you know, a, a widespread failure to prevent the, you know, the massive amount of death we've seen in American cities. Is that at least a decent answer? Oh, that's great. Thank you, Paul. You'll inspire me to write something that answers that very lucidly and concisely. I mean it. I would love to hear your more, your further thoughts as well. Um, so um, let me ask a question to uh, uh, Mark and Russ to, to tag team. This one's from the audience. Um, how would you advise um, researchers and drug makers to identify causality using ML and AI rather than mere correlation. So this, this may begin with an explanation of what deep learning is, 
um, but not too long, please. I think Rush should kick that one off for sure. <laughs> okay, so ML is machine learning. Deep learning is a type of machine learning. It is. Uh, it has two main features. It can. It is capable of amazing performance, and it is virtually inscrutable in terms of understanding why the good performance happens. Those are all generalizations that I will press submit on, as as, as I've been taught. So, um, it is possible. There is a whole theory of AI and causal reasoning, um, different from correlation. Everybody knows that correlation may or may not be because of causation. There is a higher bar for causation when an analyzing data, and there are theories about how to do this. Um, I would say that at a time of emergency, where those theories are still emerging, okay, that it would be fine to try them, but you need to use the old fashioned methods for mechanism today. And that's experimental science with appropriate controls. Uh, in the clinical sphere, it's randomized controlled trials. Uh, and in the, in the molecular sphere, it's the hard work of um, viral assays, isolating your systems and, and testing the impact of the, of the molecules on these systems. Um, so I am not bullish in um, June of 2020 about a big causal reasoning chain for AI. I don't rule it out as a possibility, but I don't think we should bank on it because these are emerging ideas that are very new. Yeah, I think only thing I would add is, uh, and, and this is maybe stepping away from the, uh, the computational pieces of it, which the other people on the panel are way more qualified to comment on than I am. But I think one of the things, and when you think about application of genetics in medicine, where we're still challenged is we find an association genetically, we don't know if that if one intervenes at the time of disease diagnosis with that gene, whether it's interventionally useful. So expanding that back to COVID, I think what a lot of the broader things like Dr. Barabasi's work, et cetera, do is they create this big pot of ideas that we can use. And that's great. I think what you then need to filter down is which of these are the ones that make the sense to our growing understanding of the biology. Maybe those go to the top. Maybe you have to be a little biased based on that information coming from the biology and then test empirically in that sort of an order. But also understand that sometimes what we get are associations that are not necessarily telling us what would happen and be useful interventionally. And I think the biggest challenge in SARS-CoV-2 has been, it is probable, but we don't know, that if you intervene too late with something that's only antiviral, it may not do anything to alter the disease course once the immune components have taken over. So there, I think understanding that transition, understanding that at a deep level, being able to use techniques like AI and machine learning to build when that crossover point might be, but to build a big pot of ideas is probably the right way to prioritize what you take into empirical testing. So let me see if um, Dr. Barbaris, Dr. Uh, uh, sorry, Barbara Bossi has, uh, Sure. Would, would like to um, add to this conversation was actually uh, yeah, going sure, at a sure. good clip right now. And, and this is a very good question. Of course, at the end, the clinical trials are the one to tell us whether there is really causation there, right? That's what they are for. Uh, I think a bigger challenge for us is really first is to emphasize that these methodologies are about identifying drugs that can perturb the right neighborhood of the network. And it could actually make it worse rather than improving the, the disease state. So that's where the, the experimental testing and the clinical trial is necessary. For us, actually, in the machine learning and the AI space, one of the very interesting uh, questions was, why does the algorithm make that prediction? And we spent quite a bit of time actually extracting what is the information these algorithms are using to make the specific predictions and how they differ and how they not. And if I want to step back at the big picture, the way I look at it is that, let's face it, you know, we may not be able to do something really useful at the time space is necessary, but COVID for us is becoming the new E. coli. That is that becoming the system where there is so much data available that spans everything from the molecular mechanisms all the way to the social effects and contract tracing and everything, that it will become a unique system Volume. The the uh, Hungarian self-censoring uh, algorithm uh, broke right. in. So um, 
<laughs> evolving right now for our, for our scientific community. And I think that's the value and that's why we have to continue working for it, even if we miss the opportunity to have patients to be treated. And I'm hoping that by the time these drugs are ready, there will be no one to treat with them. Yeah. Great. Um, I have a, a, a good question to, um, for either an, an ultimate or a penultimate question. Let me actually have Zach take the first crack at this one, but then open it up to this whole group who should have um, Ken, insights uh, to offer. We're actually, uh, just out of time. So if we could just do final comments, close it up. No last All right. question. Uh, we could do this one last question, uh, but I don't think we'll be able to open up to the whole group for comment. Okay, okay. let's start right. with that. <laughs> um, at, at, this is from a student. Um, at present, there is no direct program for studying decision, precision medicine. For a medical student outside of the US, what would be the best path to research, develop, and practice in the field of hyper-individualized medicine? Wow, that is such a great question. And I don't have a good answer to it uh, because it's really a multidisciplinary approach. And very few medical schools, very few universities uh, have courses which bring it all together. As Paul puts out, points out, if you don't involve the social uh, aspect of it, you're missing out. If you don't miss out, don't include the reimbursement part of it, you miss out. As we learned from Julia, uh, Julia when she talked about her, her kid with uh, Mila, she said, the problem is not the science. They figured that was easy. Even getting money for the therapy was not that hard. It was actually finding Tim Yu who would actually do it. Turned out to be hard, uh, uh, important. And what we're, see, we're hearing from Amy Abernathy at, at the FDA is that we need these new infrastructures, these new platforms uh, to, to be able to uh, bring these things together. And what I hear from, uh, from Mark is that maybe some of the academic approaches don't even work necessarily particularly well. And so I think that collectively, what we see here is a, a crazy of many of the disciplines that need to come together to create a hyper-individualized medicine. And I hope that this conference in its multiple instances is a goad towards getting there. So let me uh, reassure my uh, uh, colleague uh, from a not US uh, a university that there are essentially very few universities unless uh, the annoying uh, Stanford representative wants to uh, disagree with me. Uh, I, I just don't think this is taught uh, systematically uh, in, in this country even. So I, I think it's a multidisciplinary opportunity. And I wanna point out that uh, when William Welch um, heard about what was going on in Europe about understanding infectious diseases, uh, having spent time uh, in Vienna and seeing what was done with hand washing, which still we don't do that well until very recently, and learning about infectious diseases, what he was able to do was transform American medicine into a much more data-driven, scientifically uh, driven uh, process in a way that medicine then was not. And as a result, in the Flexner Report, it, that subsequently happened in 1910, half the American University of Medical Schools closed down, some unfortunately for some really uh, underserved communities. But one the point- We have one minute left. Yeah, but, but the point is, that these communities, that um, this transformation is something that does have to happen. And I think this conference highlights it. So I just wanna really end there and thank you all for your participation. I wanna thank our sponsors, Merck and Metadata. I wanna thank our many speakers, as well as this panel and the moderators such as Ken Mandel, Raj Manrai and Matt Might. And most importantly, the people behind the scenes, this is much harder than it should be, um, uh, Harlan Reiniger, Catherine Ward, Rachel Eastwood, and most importantly, Samantha Lemos, who's really uh, steered the whole thing. Thank you very much. And with that, I hope the weather is good wherever you are and you can enjoy a bit of the day. Thank you all. See you next year, hopefully in the flesh. <laughs>